Hello, my name is Tom Fredericks. I am the Vice President and General Manager of the Electrical Division for American Polywater Corporation. We want to thank you for attending our Pull Planner 3000 software tips and tricks training. We will have a short PowerPoint presentation prior to the software demo to discuss how we test coefficients of friction and how those differ from the industry standards. You'll need to understand this so that you can better utilize the software program. The PowerPoint, again, will last about 15 minutes. During this seminar, we are hoping that we will help you become more familiar with the software as well as more confident in using it to save money on your construction costs and labor time on your upcoming projects. You will be able to become more confident in entering your conduit designs so that you know that you have them inputted correctly. We're going to show you how to use the taskbar so that you can utilize the options for adding rollers, inputting cable pushers, and flagging maximum tension and sidewall pressures. Finally, the gem of this whole program today is that you will be able to use your actual field tensions, meaning the ending tensions on your cable pulls, to more accurately predict and plan your future cable pulls by learning how to back calculate your coefficients of friction using the software program. This will make a lot more sense once we get into the software, but by far this is the best tool that you'll learn today, which is not on any help screen. Polywater products are used heavily to construct the following types of projects that you see on this slide here. In fact, over 85% of all U.S. power utilities have polywater lubricants on standards for pulling in their transmission, distribution, and network cabling. If you're not getting our technical talk, this is a publication that comes out three to four times per year. It is emailed, so you'll want to subscribe to this. If you go onto our website, please fill out the form. And besides filling out the form, make sure that you notify your IT department that you would like to receive emails from custserve at polywater.com. That email address is C U S as in Sam T S as in Sam. E-R-V as in Victor, at polywater.com. This publication is written specifically for electrical contractors, electrical engineers, utilities, and industrials. The subject matter always deals with the electrical market, and these topics will be very innovative for you to read about. We're involved with all types of cable installation, termination, and protection products for the transmission, distribution, instrumentation, and electrical construction industries. We have numerous new products, and I'd like to just briefly tell you about three of them before we move on. If you're not aware, in the sealant area, we manufacture a product called Power Patch. Power Patch is used to seal up active leaks in transformers, whether the transformers SF6 gas or oil, the power patch can fix those leaks in the field without having to shut your substation down and you can work hot. It's an in-field fix, very easy to use. The other product that I wanted to tell you about, which happens to be our number one seller right now, is our FST-250 foam duct sealant. The foam duct sealant is used to keep water, gas, and air from traveling through conduit systems and damaging electrical equipment such as switchgear. The FST-250 foam duct sealant comes in a cartridge that fits in a caulking gun and it holds up to 22 feet of waterhead pressure. The final product is called Bonduit Conduit Adhesive. And this product bonds HDPE, or high-density polyethylene conduit, which would be the roll pipe that you see out there, to PVC, rigid steel, or fiberglass, making an airtight, watertight seal. The advantage of Bonduit is that it 
that product is much less expensive than the couplers out there, offers better performance and higher pullout strengths than those couplers, and you can use it above 4 inch to bond 4 inch, 5 inch, and 6 inch conduits to make those connections. For a full range of our products, please visit our website. Most of you know us just as a lubricant manufacturer, but over the last 15 years we have really diversified. First, what's so important and why should you care about planning your pulls with the Pull Planner 3000 software program? You should care because replacement of failed cables costs millions of dollars per year. Installation is the most significant contributor to failure. Most cable damage is not visible to the installer or the customer. Failures usually happen weeks or months later and will reduce the overall life of the cables. As you can see from this slide, the manufacturers have discovered that over 90% of premature failure is due to damage during installation. Now here is some of the hidden damage that we'd like to show you that happens during cable pulls. Most people believe that cable damage only occurs from too much ending tension, meaning if you were doing a tug-of-war with the cable, that would be the way ending tension is. But in fact, sidewall pressure is the most commonly occurred damage to cables. So if you look at the picture here in the upper left-hand corner, you can see that this cable went around a bend or a sweep, and because it built up so much friction going around that bend, during high sidewall pressure, it not only burned the cable jacket off down to the conductor, it literally melted it, causing failure. Over here on the right, you can see this cable where the flat strap concentric neutral was completely obliterated because, it's because of too much high sidewall pressure. But if you look at the cable jacket, the cable jacket appears completely fine. Down in the lower left-hand corner, you can see the strands of the conductor were completely broken, and this was due to ending tension. Now, other field complications include rope burn-through of sweeps, like you see here in this picture, broken conduits, conduits that have been pulled completely off of walls or racking, excessive equipment wear, unsafe operations like broken ropes and blocks that can be shot through the conduit system into vaults or manholes injuring people. Now let's just take a minute here just to talk about sidewall pressure and I'm going to take some uh, excerpts from two manufacturers but most cable manufacturers have excellent information in their cable installation guidelines but one from a, an old Anaconda paper um, talks about sidewall pressure, and sidewall pressure increases with pulling tension, which is the stretching force developed between the two ends of the cable during installation and decreases as the radius of the bend increases. If the resulting force exceeds the compression cut strength of the cable components, particularly the insulation, Premature cable failure can occur due to the crushed insulation, displaced or damaged shielding systems, slit or torn jackets, deformed interlocked armor, or cuts and crushing of the preassembled aerial cables. Remember, most of this damage is hidden. Now we'll be referring to another publication here once we get into the software. But let's talk about coefficients of friction. What is the definition of coefficient of friction and how is it measured? When we take a look at frictional forces, you can see by the slide here we have a cable that's in a conduit system. And if the cable weight weighs 10 pounds per foot, you have an equal force pushing up on the cable called the normal force, which would also be 10 pounds per foot. When we pull the cable, that's the pulling force. We're trying to pull it across a conduit, and it's trying to overcome the frictional force. The frictional force is the difference between the cable jacket and the conduit surface. 
So if we look at the general laws of physics, if this cable weighed 10 pounds per foot and it took 5 pounds to move it across the conduit, the coefficient of friction would be 0.5. Now how does polywater measure coefficients of friction and why do so many people come to polywater for this information? The friction table was one of the first devices that we invented to measure coefficients of friction. What we have is a device where we have a frictionless sled and in the sled we cut a half pipe of conduit. So we can cut EMT, rigid steel, HDPE, PVC, whatever type of conduit that we want to test. And on top of the conduit we put a piece of cable. Now we test both dry cable or unlubricated cable and lubricated cables. You can see that we have a rail system here and the sled is hooked up to a winch. The winch is pulled or starts to pull the sled and then the measurements are taken on this load cell. The sidewall pressure foot imitates going around bends or 90s and applies pressure to the cable going down into the conduit. From that friction table test, we have an output that measures points at a tenth of a second so that we can really get a observation over a period of time to come up with an average. And you can see here we had a polyethylene cable jacket in a PVC conduit using polywater J and the average coefficient of friction was 0 0.08. We tend to do hundreds of these tests to come up with very accurate numbers. Now some of the things that the friction table can't do that we like to imitate or try to imitate more what's happening in the field is we created the multi-bend tester. The difference is in this test we can put 90s or sweeps in here. In this example we have 540 degrees worth of bends. So that's one difference. The second difference is that we can bring in one cable or we can bring in multiple cables. So if we wanted to test control cable, we could pull in 12 cables or we can pull in three cables. The other difference is that over here we have a brake, a pneumatic brake that's on this chain that's connected to this load cell to the cable. Now what is incoming tension or why would we put back tension or a brake on a cable pull? The reason for that is simple. When you are pulling cable out there, if you have a reel of cables that's brand new and all the cable is on it, that's going to weigh much more than a reel of cables that's only half full. So when you were to start a pull, if you had a full set of reels, you would be able to, sorry about that, you would be able to take a look at the back tension, so meaning the weight of those reels, if the cable puller was doing all of the work, it would take a lot more effort for the tugger to start that pull than a reel of cables that was only half full. The other difference is that if we could imagine that this blue column here was a utility pole, a wood utility pole, and along this pole we had a conduit, a riser pole going up alongside of it, and the reel of cables was down on the ground, but we had to go up along the, along the pole over a bull wheel or a shiv or a roller and down into the conduit. If this cable weighed 10 pounds per foot and we had to go 20 feet in the air, we would have 200 pounds of cable entering the conduit system. That's another way to test back tensions. The final thing that we learned from the multi-bend tester was that if you are pulling cables, it is by far best to have your two cables go in alongside the inside of the bend or sweep and the third cable will be on top in a triangular configuration. The way that you can keep them separated is by putting a bar in between the two bottom cables and the one on top. This will help the cables from trying to override each other when being fed into that first 90. We have had a lot of papers published about our testing and you can access these on our website. The most important 
item for you to keep in mind is that there is no one coefficient of friction, meaning the cable manufacturers in the industry will tell you to use a 0.35 coefficient of friction or higher regardless of what type of jacket and conduit they're pulling in. And I'm going to explain why they do that on the next slide, but let's just review here what is going on with the testing where we have a PVC jacket on various conduits. So here you can see that we have a rigid steel conduit system and the unlubricated number is almost 0.6 but lubricated is 0.18. The same PVC jacket using Polywater J on an HDPE conduit is at about a 0.11 whereas unlubricated is at a 0.3. Because we have different coefficients of friction with a PVC jacket on different types of conduit, we're going to use this information in the pull planner to better calculate what our ending tensions are. So this is a huge help. Keep in mind that when you have unlubricated values here, that's the same as your crews not using enough cable pulling lubricant. So it is very, very important that you're specifying polywater lubricants every time people are pulling cable. Because if they don't use lubricant, the numbers are going to become much higher and even small difference in coefficients of friction will make big differences in ending tensions. So why do the cable manufacturers use a 0.35? They use a 0.35 because these variables that you see on the slide greatly affect coefficients of friction. The first one is temperature. When you have a very cold day out and you're going to pull cable, let's say you're in Minnesota like I am right now in the middle of January, the cables will become stiff. When they become stiff as they enter the conduit systems, they are going to ride not only on the bottom, but they're also going to be on top because of the real memory. The same is true if you're pulling in a very hot environment, like if you're in Nevada or Arizona in the middle of the summer, the cable jackets, because they're black, tend to absorb heat and more or less become sticky. So if you're not using enough lubricant when you're pulling those cables in, those cables are much more pliable and tend to ride over each other. We talked about how the difference in cable jacket type and conduit affect the variables of coefficients of friction. But more importantly, if you're not using enough lubricant, again, that's going to greatly affect how much coefficient of friction is between the outside of the cable jacket and the conduit surface. Of course, the number of cables and the weight of the cable. The final point, which is not on this slide, is the condition of the conduit. If you're pulling through water or if you're pulling in a conduit system that wasn't quite level, if you're pulling in a conduit system that has dirt or sand in it, all of those variables will affect the coefficients of friction. So the cable manufacturers do a great job out there, but because they're warranting the cable, they have to allow for some of these factors. Our most famous pull to date is the pull that we did at Pearl Harbor with American Electric, a company out of Hawaii that did this job. The pull was done under the USS Arizona in Pearl Harbor. It was almost a mile long. It's not the longest cable pull Polywater has done, but by far it got the most press and it was written up in Electrical Contractor Magazine. Why did American Electric come to American Polywater? First of all, they knew that they should be using the Pull Planner 3000 to calculate the pull because they could not splice it. As you can see from this diagram, we have over four sweeps and we have elevation change throughout the pull. The second thing is a steel pipe was bored underneath Pearl Harbor and then HDPE conduits were pulled back through the steel pipe. When they did the pull, they used a coefficient of friction on our recommendation of 0.17. The calculated ending tension on this pull, or the predicted tension, was 7,028 pounds. But you can see here that the pull peaked slightly under 7,000 pounds, 
So the actual coefficient of friction during this pull was less than a 0.17, but you can see how accurate our numbers are. Now how do you measure ending tension on cable pulls and how are we going to use that in the pull planner software coming up here in just a few minutes? The two ways to use um, to measure ending tensions are a running line tensionometer and dynamometers. Dynamometers are also fixed onto your cable pullers or your cable pulling trucks. Here you can see the head end of the cable coming out of the conduit system. The reason that we want to measure or the reason why we want to take the value at the end is that we have nothing but cable in that conduit and that's the best representation. So what we want to do is have you start having your crews take the ending tensions off their cable pulls so we can back calculate the field effective coefficients of friction. So as the cable's coming out of the head end of the conduit system, if your tape or your monitor says that there was 5,228 pounds of ending tension, that's the number you want to write down because that's the number we're going to use to back calculate your coefficient of friction. Running line tensionometers are in line, so they give a more accurate representation of what the ending tension is. So if you're specifying polywater lubricants, that is an excellent thing to do because what we're trying to do is lower the tension on your cable pulls. So the real purpose of polywater lubricants is to reduce the friction. We'll have less cable jacket and insulation damage. We're going to minimize stuck cables and repulls. We're going to have faster, easier, and safer pulls by specifying polywater and by using the Pull Planner 3000 to predict your tensions on cable pulls. So how much is cable pulling lubricant? Cable pulling lubricant is very inexpensive. In fact, it's the most inexpensive item on your job. When we take a look at this slide here, you'll see that we have a formula which is the length of the conduit system times the diameter of the pipe times 0 0.0015. This would be for a pristine condition. We would actually use a 0 0.0025 if we had multiple bends, we were pulling in an old conduit system, we had heavy weight of cable, and then it, what we would essentially get to is one gallon of lubricant per 100 feet of conduit. So if you were to write something down in your specs or you were to tell your crews the best general rule of thumb for cable pulling lubricants is one gallon of lube per 100 feet. Here, three gallons of lube is only $36. We can see the cost of the PVC conduit is almost $800, and the cost of a couple 500 MCM cables is almost $4,500. So where does Polywater get their information, or what is the pull planner based on how do we get these mathematical equations? Well, we use the same mathematical equations in our software program that you would have to do in longhand, and they're called the Riffenberg equations. Again, we're going to be going to the software program in two slides, but it's really important that you understand this difference between straight sections and bend sections as how it relates to coefficients of friction. The tension out of a straight section equals the tension coming in plus the length of the straight run times the weight of the cable times the coefficient of friction. So this is all in line. But in a bend section, the tension out of a bend equals the tension coming into a bend times, and here's where you can see you not only have the bend angle, but the coefficient of friction are now an exponent. So as most of you know, the more bends you have, generally the higher the tension you have and the more sidewall pressure you're going to have out there. So after we've gone through that, I'd like to ask everybody this question before we get into the software. If you were going to pull a cable, let's say you had a single cable that weighed 10 pounds per foot, which way would be better to pull? Would it be better to pull from A to B 
or B to A. I'll give everybody a couple seconds to think about that and then we're going to go right to the software. It's always better to pull from B to A. Now you can see from the last couple of slides that we went over, if we take 10 pounds times 50, we have 500 pounds going from B into the first bend. So we only have 500 pounds going into these four bends here, whereas if we're pulling from A to B, we're going to have 3,000 pounds of cable coming into those bends. And because we have so much more weight coming to the bends, that's going to increase the ending tension and the sidewall pressure. So it's always better to pull through your bends first. If you were to show this slide to your cable pulling crews, most of them would think it's better to pull from A to B because they think they have a running start going through the bends, or if something were to happen, at least they'd have the 300 feet of cable to pull in. So by using the software, it's going to be equally important that you tell your crews which direction is better to pull. So let's go to the software here. When you pull up the software, this is the screen you're going to come to. So let's go over the things that you can do with the Pull Planner 3000 software program. The first thing is, is that if you are a veteran of the Pull Planner and you have a software program out there, I would encourage you to go up to links and click on Upgrade to see if you have the most current version. You'll see that this screen comes up and it will tell you what your present version number is and then it will tell you what the newest version is. And as you can see, this is the newest version of the software. But if you had a number less than this, then you need to upgrade it. You just simply put in your name and your company and we'll send you the download instructions. The second thing that you can do is you can go up to units and if you like to work in metric versus English, that's something you can do. You can also go up to the edit screen and we can change the color of the background, the text. Uh, you can just make any combination that you want. So it defaults in this blue and black. That's how it comes. Now obviously we're not going to do number five. We're not going to exit the pull planner. We're going to do number one and that's calculating tension on a cable pull from scratch. Number two would be that your crews gave you that information from that pull, 5,228 pounds. And now you want to back calculate and see what the field effective coefficient of friction is. And again, this will make more sense and I'm going to show you how to do it in number one instead. Number three is that if you did a pull from a previous day and you want to pull it up again, you simply double click on here and it will come to this where you see you can choose from the pulls that we've done before. But we're going to go here and we're going to go to this database just to show you how easy it is to enter information. Now why would you use the cable database? I would encourage you to use it if you are an industrial account where you have the same type of cable and conduit being pulled in at your facility, if you're a utility and you have the same network or URD or transmission cable, or you're a contractor and you have a big job. Because once you put this information in, you never have to go back and enter it again. You can choose it on a future screen. So you can go up to edit here and let's go ahead and just put in a new cable here. Now there is a one character code that you can use. Uh, N we say is for network, U is for URD, T is for transmission, M is for medium voltage. But you can use whatever character code you would like. So if you wanted to call it K, you can do that. And if you wanted to put down here, oops, sorry about that. So if you wanted to call it substation feeders, you can make it as long a name as you would like. Now when you come over to these two cells, what's important to understand is when it's asking you for the cable outside diameter or the cable weight, you get this information from your cable specs. If you don't have the specs handy and you need to get a hold of somebody at one of the major cable manufacturers, please give us a call and we can give you 
a number of application engineers that we deal with on a regular basis, and they can give you the cable specs. But what I wanted to point out is that the cable OD that you want to put here is the complete outside diameter of the cable, including the jacket you'll see that the cable manufacturers break it down so they start out with just the conductor outside diameter, the conductor plus the insulation, the conductor plus the insulation and semicon and so on and so forth. So it's important to carry out the entire outside diameter so if it states it's 1.532 then that's what you should be putting in. Now for the cable weight, usually they will give you the cable weight per thousand. So you'll have to do a little bit of math to figure it out. But if the cable weight weighed 1.04, that's what you'd put in there. Now one thing that you can do is you can come up here and if you want to sort the cable data, we can sort it by weight. And then it will bring it from, as you see here, the lightest cable to the heaviest cable. You can sort it by name, you can sort it by type, you have diameter, lots of different variables that you can do. If you ever have a question on the pull planner, you just go up to help and the help button will only deal with what is on this screen. So you won't get any other menu information or any other information or help information from future screens or previous screens. It's just on this screen, so it's an easy way to work with the help. So we're going to go back here and we're going to choose number one. Now number one, again, is calculating tension from scratch. So we need to put in the name of the pull or the job. And I'll do some advertising here for the company. The next question is going to ask you to input the inner diameter of conduit. This is the only time where rounding is good, meaning if you're pulling in 2 inch, just put 2 inch, 3 inch, 4 inch, 5 inch. You can look in the specs of some of the conduit manufacturers and they do carry it out such as 4.002139, but in this case just put in 4. Now. If you didn't enter the database cable, meaning you didn't have that library, you could click on add a non-database cable and it's going to ask you for the same information, the weight per foot and the outside diameter. So let's show you both ways. One, we're going to come in here and we're going to come and choose a cable. So I'm just going to choose this first cable here. And you don't have to add up the cable if you're pulling in three cables. You don't need to do it manually. This question that's flashing down here is asking you how many of these cables, this type of cable, are you pulling in. And we're going to use three for an example. Now, if you are pulling in a ground or a neutral and you needed to add another type of cable, you could either go here to a database cable or, just to show you how this works, it's going to ask you how, um, what is the weight of the cable and the outside diameter and the number. And you can see type 2 would come up here. If you were pulling in control cable, you would just keep doing it until you had all the cables in here. Now, if you made a mistake or you didn't want a cable in here, you simply click on that cable and you can hit remove. If you had to change it, you can go ahead and change it and put your new information in there. Since we are happy with what we've entered, let's go ahead and hit accept. The question on the screen now is asking, will the cables be triplexed? Now the definition of triplex that we're using here is that you ordered cable from a cable manufacturer and they wove the three cables together to make a braided cable. That's what triplex cable means. In this case, we're going to put no. Um, just if you wanted to know, when you order braided cable, triplex cable, it really keeps everything tight. It makes for good cable pulls. That's why people would choose to do that. Now this screen, again, if you, if you had questions on it, when you go to the help button, it would only deal with what's on the screen here. But why do we have this summary? And wh what do you get to learn from this screen? Well, the first thing is you can take a look at 
your conduit fill. So if you have to abide by the NEC code or you are working for a company that has limitations on conduit fill, you can go ahead and take a look at where that's at. This is also extremely helpful in the case of you are working for someone and the customer tells you that this year this is the cables that we'll need to power our plant but in the future if we double in size we're going to have to bring in much larger power system to, to power our plant so we're going to have to bring in bigger cables. You can go ahead and take a look at putting the first set of cables in and then you can go back and you can put in new cable data to see where that conduit fill would be to make sure you're not exceeding it. So if you can stick with 4 inch, obviously 4 inch conduit is like less expensive than 5 inch and that's where that comes into play. The calculated weight correction factor is 1.3. So what's a weight correction factor? Why, why is that even there? If we go back here and we pull up this slide on the weight correction factor, you can see that the weight correction factor adjusts the equation, the mathematical equations, to account for the number of cables in contact with the duct. So if you're only pulling in a single cable, the weight correction factor is always going to be equal to one. If we pull in three cables that are in a cradle configuration, then it does the calculations and in this case it's a 1.44 and if we are in a triangular configuration you can see that there are only two points of rub meaning these two cables are rubbing on the cable and our weight correction factor is less. Now if you are pulling in four cables so three cables in a ground here then our weight correction factor will always be equal to 1.4, which is a very conservative number. Now, some cable manufacturers and some engineers would like to override that 1.4 number because they would like to be, they would like to just adjust it either up or down. And if you wanted to do that, you simply go to tools and you can go ahead and override it. But our 1.4 for those four cables is going to be an excellent conservative number that's widely accepted in the industry. You can see that the configuration of cables will be cradled. So you're either going to see the word cradled, single, triangular, or complex. Single obviously is just one cable, complex is four or more cables, and triangular was like you saw in this picture here. Now most people think that by oversizing conduits it's much easier to pull cable. Well it's somewhat true but in fact when you oversize conduits and your cables are in a cradle configuration if you have a lot of short radius bends especially if you have back-to-back -back bends in different directions such as coming into a horizontal bend kicking right and then followed by a horizontal bend kicking left. When you have a cradled configuration, you have more chance of those cables spreading out in the bends and wedging themselves in there, whereas in a triangular configuration, generally you just have two cables touching on the conduit, making for less friction. The final thing is where you see jam clearance analysis, you'll see that in this case jamming is not probable. In the next upgrade of the software, we'll have the percentages here showing you so that if it does come up that, that jamming is probable, then it will give you a percentage over here telling you what, what that probability of happening would occur. The last one that you would see is check cable clearance. So if we put in too large of cables that can't really fit into the conduit system, that's what it would state down here. So everything is fine. Let's go ahead and hit accept. Now this little uh, window that popped up here is something that I'm going to tell you about. So you can go ahead and click in this box here so it never appears again. But basically it's telling you about this screen. We need to choose a type of lubricant first so that it will tell us what the coefficients of friction are. So let's go ahead and click on 
Polywater LZ, which is our product that was made especially for low smoke, zero halogen, CSPE, CPE, or Hypalon type of jacketed cables for areas where you're very concerned about fire propagation or high occupancy buildings, uh, nuclear power plants, for example. If you don't know anything about this lubricant, you can simply click on View the Specifications of Polywater LZ, and the flyer will come up, and it will give you a description about the product, a bunch of technical information, but at the end of every one of our flyers, the two most important things for most people are, what are the catalog numbers so I know how to buy it? Um, does it come in winter grade? Yes, it does. It also comes in a pourable version. But for the specifying engineers that we have on the line, what we would like you to do is cut and paste the spec that's on the back page and put it into your specifications so that the end user is going to be using a lubricant that's compatible with the types of cables that they need to pull in. It will leave a very small residue, less than 4% in the conduit, so it won't cement the cables in there, and it will have the lowest coefficients of friction, and it will meet the IEEE standard 1210. But you can just simply cut and paste that and put it in your specs. Once you've chosen the lube, then you take a look at the type of conduit that you're pulling in. So let's say that we're pulling into PVC. You can take a look at the lubricated numbers with Polywater LZ and the unlubricated. If you're pulling into rigid steel, you can see the differences in the coefficients of friction. Now, if we didn't know if LZ was the best combination for rigid steel and cross-link polyethylene, we could come to Polywater J and click on rigid steel and you can see that for crosslink polyethylene it's actually higher so LZ is a better product to use when we're pulling in to rigid steel conduit so let's go ahead and and assume that we're using a crosslink polyethylene jacket into rigid steel so it's a 0 0.10 you'll see the flashing here that reviews it and the coefficient of friction came up here we'll hit accept the box that just popped up here is asking what your incoming or back tension is. Remember, we talked about the weight that uh, cable reels can have. Um, you've got different types of scenarios where you might be pulling vertically, and that's what it's asking here. We're going to put in zero for now, but I'm going to show you how much back tension affects both ending tension and sidewall pressure. Again, this box here is just telling you that to start entering your conduit data on the screen, you need to touch on or click on Add Segment. So you can go ahead and click in that box so it doesn't appear again and hit OK. Now, if everyone could just take a moment and get a piece of paper out and a pen, I would like you to draw this pull because I can't keep it on the screen. It will keep disappearing. So I'll give you just a second to grab a paper and a pen and then we'll draw out this pull. We're going to have a pull here that will try to incorporate all the factors that you'll have using the software program. So we're going to pull straight down into a 90. So it's a stubbed up 90. We're going to go along at zero degrees, or perfect horizontal. We're going to come into a 45 degree bend, turning up at 45 degrees. We'll 45 back to horizontal. We're going to pull a long way, and I'll give you the numbers here in a second, into a vault or a manhole. And then I'm going to add a shiv, or a roller, and we're going to pull up 20 feet in the air. We're going to say that we're pulling down a straight section for 7 feet, coming into a 90 degree bend that will be a 4 foot radius. Then we're going to pull 110 feet, coming into a 45 degree bend here, and that will also be a 4 foot radius, and we'll pull up 
at a 45 degree angle or pitch for 75 degrees coming into another 45 degree bend that will turn us back down to zero or horizontal here another four footer and then we're going to pull 700 feet so the pull itself will pull down seven feet go around that 90 go 110 feet up a 45 back across the 45 and pull that way if you were pulling up at a three degrees a three degree rise here or you were pulling down a 17 degree slope then you would just simply put the number three in here or 17 these three choices are just kind of speed choices because these are the most common angles for cable pulls here we know that we're pulling down 90 degrees from horizontal horizontal meaning zero degrees we're at 90 degrees from horizontal so we can click on 90 or you could type in 90 there we're going to be pulling down this stubbed up cable so we can click on down and as I mentioned we're going to pull down for seven feet now what type of bend is this we know that we were pulling straight down 90 degrees from horizontal into a stubbed up 90 degree bend so what type of a bend is it this is the most confusing question probably for most people so we've added these uh, little pictures here to try to help you out these illustrations and you can see that this bend the inside of the bend faces up the question that the bend that this bend question is asking you is not which direction you're pulling through the bend that's the next question it's asking you which way the bend is facing and we know from this picture this is exactly how it is and it's a vertical concave up bend but we're pulling down through the bend and we said that the radius was going to be four feet 90 degrees now you can see that my little diagram went away here but the first segment when we enter segments it is always straight section to the end of the bend so we're going to have to click on add segment next and we're going to do this segment here which is going to be 120 foot straight section coming into a 45 and we get around the 45 that will be the end of segment number two so you click on add segment we're at zero degrees remember we came out the bottom of that bend we're at zero we're going to go 110 feet and now we're coming into a vertical concave up bend so we went 110 feet and now we're kicking up at a 45 degree bend so we have a vertical concave up bend we're pulling up through this bend it's a four foot radius and we said it was a 45 degree bend so we need to input the next part of our pull so again just as a reminder we always go straight section so segment one was 90 degrees down around the 90 we stopped segment two was 110 feet going into that 45 kicker up and we stopped now we're going to go up at 45 degrees here and we're going to come into another 45 degree bend turning us back to horizontal and this will be segment number three so click on add segment we're going up at a 45 degree angle now if you had a 30 degree kicker here then you would just type in 30 or if it was 17 remember you're not limited by what's just here and we're pulling up at that during that 45 degree pitch we said we were going to do it for 75 feet and now we're coming to a vertical concave down bend because the inside bend of that next 45 is facing down so the inside of the bend is facing down here we're pulling up through that bend it's a four foot radius 45 degrees 
And now we're going to put in the last segment of our pull. I'm going to do the roller later because we have lots of stuff to show you. But the final section is the 700 feet here, and then we'll stop. So click on Add Segment. We're at zero degrees because we came out of that bend back to horizontal. We're going to go 700 feet, and we're going to have no bend because we're going to say we're going to stop right in that manhole or vault. So let's explain a couple of things that, that are going on here. First of all, if you wanted to make sure that you were entering these segments properly, let me quickly draw this out again. Not the greatest artist, as you can see, but you just simply take your cursor, and we want to know if we entered segment two correctly. You can put it on any one of these cells. Hold down with your left mouse button, and you can see that segment two states that it's a straight conduit section. There's no incline. Good, because we were at zero degrees. We went 110 feet, and then we came to a conduit bend. We were pulling up through a 45 degree bend. It's a vertical concave up bend. The radius was four feet, and it even tells you how much cable was in that bend. So we did it. So if you wanted to check the next one, you simply put your cursor in there, hold down with the button, and it pops up the information. Now, if you made a mistake, and the crew called you up and they said, you know what, this wasn't 700 feet, this was actually 710 feet. You can double click in any one of those cells and you can change anything that you want to change. So if you made a mistake, you can go change anything in here. Now, remember we talked about coefficients of friction. We recommend, we highly recommend because the factors that affect coefficients of friction would be even pulling ropes. Winch lines are by far the best tool to use when you're pulling cable because they don't stretch at all. The next best thing is double braided ropes. Also, winch lines don't tend to cut through conduit. If the crews are using just a regular rope that stretches, remember if we have water in there, sand, you know that no conduit system is perfectly level, so we recommend using different coefficients of friction. 0.1 high is perfect conditions. Let's go up here and let's put in the cable manufacturer recommended number or the industry recommended number of a 0.35. Now look here, we have 482 and we have a negative number here right now and that's because we have no back tension. We're assuming that the crews are actually moving the cable reels, meaning they're walking the cables off the reels or they're grabbing onto the cables and they're feeding the cable into that bend. Now if they're not, we're going to show you by adding back tension there what happens. But the reason why you see a negative number is you have gravity going down that seven feet and the cable's just kind of falling off the reel and that's the reason why you see a negative number. Typically, you're only going to see this on a down incline or pulling into stubbed up 90s. So remember, we just clicked in this box here, and we're going to put in 0.35. Now 482 now goes to 1454 inning tension. Now we would recommend using a number between 0 0.10 and 0 0.35, kind of as your in-between number or your safety number and let's just say that we go to a 0 0.20 and you can see that's 843. So 0 0.35 we would use at our high number. So let's go back to that. Now let's go over here. Now people have asked us, is there a general rule of thumb or an industry standard of how much incoming or back tension to put in? There really isn't because you have different variables. Some people are pulling in transmission cable, other people are pulling in fiber optic cable, so the, the reels of cable will all weigh differently. One way you can kind of get an idea is that without having anybody move the reels, you could have the tugger start the cable pull and you'll be at zero tension, but as the startup happens, you can take a look at that tension at that time, and so if it said 500 pounds, 
you could use that as your incoming tension. Again, we'd rather see people feeding the cable in there because we can eliminate that first bend. But let's go ahead and let's put in 500 pounds. Now, notice 0 0.35, 1454, and just 92 pounds of sidewall pressure. But when we have 500 pounds of back tension, now all of a sudden, your numbers go up to 3,412 pounds and 402 pounds of sidewall pressure. If this was even higher, at 700 pounds, you can see what it does. So this back tension is critical to try to get your crews to walk the cables off the reels or feed them in. It just is a huge help when you're pulling cable. Now, let's go through a whole bunch of things that you can do with the software. Remember, we know that it's better to pull through the bends first than going down a long straight run, but let's take a look at that. Again, sometimes the crews will set up their pull based on where it's easiest to set up, or they might only have access to setting up that way. But we know that it's going to be much better to pull this way, the way we entered it, than the other way from the vault back towards the stub up. Let's see how we do that. We go up to Tools and we click on Reverse Pull. And now we can see that the sidewall pressure went up to over 1,000 pounds. And your ending tension was at 6,624 pounds. So that's what you can do with the software is figure out which way is better to pull. So let's reverse it back to normal here. And the way that you tell is that when you hit reverse, it states that it's reversed here in this window. What are some of the other things that you can do with the software? Some of you like to take a look at the bends and the straight segments separately. So you can separate the bends from straight segments. So now you can kind of see how that looks. And the other reason why you would do this is that many utilities, it's commonplace that they use rigid steel sweeps and PVC duct. Well, we know that there is no one coefficient of friction. There's different coefficients of friction for PVC and rigid steel. We also know that a lot of you that work out there, segment one through segment four might be in PVC but then all of a sudden it switches to rigid steel because of code or you might be in an old uh, building where they had rigid steel and then you put in new PVC. Whatever your case may be, you want to be able to, to adjust the coefficient of friction either for a group of segments or just for the sweeps out there. You would go to mode and you would go to variable friction mode. And over here, you can see that we have the 0.35 that was up in this box, and that populates all of these. So just for example, let's say that in rigid steel, you want to use uh, 0.15. We can go in here where all of the sweeps are, and you just simply click and type it in. Now if you didn't know what the coefficient of friction was for rigid steel sweeps or uh, for PVC, you can go up to edit and we can go to change friction coefficient and that will bring you back to that database showing you the difference between the cable jacket and the conduit surface. So you would just go back there to get that information. So again, you can do it just for the elbows or if one through four were all PVC and that was 0.35 and rigid steel was 0.15, you could put that for 5, 6, and 7. So that is how and what the variable friction is, the friction mode. Now get it, to get it back to the regular coefficient of friction that you saw, you can do that. So we'll go back to tools here again and we, we've done reverse, we've separated them, so let's combine them and put them all back together. If you were calculating these poles and you, and you needed to order some wire, you could go up here and to tools and you could figure out the total estimated length of the pole and it will tell you that you're going to have 915 feet of pole. 
Why is that important? It's important because the bends actually take up more cable. And if you have to rack the cable or you need extra cable on both ends for splicing, this gives you a good idea of how much uh, cable to order. Another question that comes up commonly is how do we measure the total length of cables? And that is simply that we measure it from the straight section to where the cables would be turned, so essentially through the bend before it's turned a different way, and then from that point to where the cables are turned again. So we, we accurately measure the cable that way. Also under tools, we have large radius bend calculator, and I'm going to do that later, but that's for pulling under rivers or lakes or you're pulling across a bridge where you have big arcs and that is going to help you calculate those arcs. It's a, it's a really neat app. We'll do that in a couple of minutes. You can go here and we can see how much lubricants needed. Now if we go and use the fair or poor method, you can see that for 915 feet of cable, we need nine gallons of lubricant. So one gallon of lube per 100 feet of cable being pulled in is why we use that. It's easy to remember for everybody. It's great to write in your specs. Depending upon the conduit condition, the weight of the cable and everything else, this is the least amount of lubricant that they should use. The harder and tougher the pull, the more and more lube you want to use because it's cheap insurance. Now if your crews are like a lot of people and they say, you know, we don't really like to use lube because we have to hand apply it. I wish there were better ways to apply lubricants or you just wanted to know more about application. On the next upgrade of the software, we'll have links to our application videos or you can print this out. It's got application instructions. But if you want to know what front end packs were, these are bags of lubricant. This is the half gallon front end packs, which are for three inch and larger size ducts. They're attached on to your winch line or pull rope that would be in the conduit system and you attach them on with a cable tie or regular electrical tape and back here you would have your Kellum's grip or your pulling eyes and your reel of cable back here. So as the puller started to take up slack and bring the winch line or pull rope through there and as your cables are following you hold a knife on the inside edge of the conduit and the bags get slit from front to back and because polywater J is so stringy it slowly oozes out lubricant in the twists and turns. We also have drill pumps and again all of this information is on our website but the application videos are wonderful. If you want them just give us a call and we'll be glad to send them out to you. But you use your own drill so the nice part about that is What's going to wear out is your drill, not our pump, because our pump is the size of your fist. It's made out of brass. There's a copper tube that goes down into the bucket or the pail. There's the pump right there. There's only one moving part in it. It's a washer. So depending on how many cables you're pulling in or how fast they're being pulled in, you can really uh, hammer on your drill, put it on full, and you can put out more lube as the pull slows down. You can back off. At the end of the pull, flip your drill in reverse. Most of the lubricant will be sucked out of the tube and be put right back in your bucket again, and the, the pump just cleans up with water. It comes over here with this cable guide, so that the hose hooks onto the cable guide, and it lubricates the cables as they're being pulled into the conduit systems. So that's some of the learning you can get there. Now, let's show you what the real power of this software program is. Remember, if you're not quite sure what the back tension is, and we're, and we're going to use a 0.35 coefficient of friction, and we're predicting 42, 49 ending tension, what we want you to do is take your cursor, and this is not in the help instruction, this is only in the tips and tricks uh, seminar here, but take your cursor, put it up in there, and when that becomes all red, you double click your mouse, and you'll see down here this target tension pops up. 
you click in that box. Now, the, what is target tension? We calculated using a 0.35 in the 700 pounds that when the crews go out, they would have 4,249 pounds ending tension. Remember, we want them to take the final ending tension measurement for when the cable or cables have just exited the end of the pole. They need to write that number down and they'll call you up. So they'll say, hey, Mario, I want to tell you what our ending tension was in the pole. Let's say they called you up and they said that the ending tension was 2,875 pounds. You hit OK you can see that now your field effective, your coefficient of friction that you're getting in the field is 0.248, not 0.35. Why is this important and how can you use this number? First of all, we recommend that if you are a person that does a lot of cable pulling, have your crews start measuring the ending tensions off of cable pulls so you can get a half a dozen or so ending tension measurements so you can get an average field effective coefficient of friction. So if you're a contractor and you're doing a big job, before you would do the most difficult pulls, if it was the same cable and conduit configuration, do some of the easier pulls first, take the ending tension, come up with your field effective coefficient of friction. So the example would be you're looking at a plan and you're doing a job takeoff as a contractor or you work for a utility or a firm that basically the engineering firm has said since day one that we are going to install a cable system and we're going to have a manhole or a vault or a pull box every 500 feet. So the distance between these four manholes or vaults is 500 feet. If in fact not only do you have that regulation or stipulation but your crews are going to set up their cable puller over here is the tugger Here's your machine. And over here is your cable reel. So you have to set this up, and you're going to set this up, and you're going to splice. Then you got to move the truck to two, set it up again, pull it in again, and splice, and then do the same thing. So you have one, two, three setups, three splices. That's a lot of labor time. That's just a lot of time in general. Each splice costs you a lot of money. By using this number, because nobody can argue with this 0.248, because that's what you've been getting consistently in the field, now you can take a look at entering segment number one, which would be, let's just say, zero degrees, pulling 500 feet, no bend. That would be segment one. And that's going to give you the tension from one to two. Then enter segment two, which would be zero degrees, 500 feet, no bend, and it's going to give you the cumulative tension. So now you can see, can I pull from one to three, and I just have to do two splices, or can I pull from one all the way to four, and I only have one splice to make, which would be just fantastic. So utilize the software, these ending tensions, to back calculate your coefficients of friction to come up with how far you can make cable pulls. We have a lot of utilities that pull 2,000 feet or more that used to only pull 700 feet. So that's the power of the software right there. Now, to get out of this tension target mode, we go up to here and we hit exit friction calculation mode. Now let's show you other helpful things that the software can do for you. In this edit segment or edit section, you can add segments which we've did. If you needed to insert a segment between one and two or two and three, you can. We can delete, change segments. A change segment, you can go up here and do it, but I find it much easier just to go down here in the box and do it. We're going to add a roller or a shiv in a minute, 
But what I wanted to do is come over here and we want to flag the maximum tension. Now all of the cable manufacturers agree to this side of this slide in that they are taking a look at when you look at maximum tension allowances, we're talking about mostly the conductor. So it doesn't matter which cable manufacturer you're purchasing your cable or wire through, they're all going to agree on the ending tension. Now there could be some cases where they've constructed their cable differently and they may give you a more robust number, a more robust derator number, and you would just simply click here to override it. So we're going to click on maximum tension allowance for a cable. We're going to choose three quarter hard and you go down here to whatever type of cable you have and this will be updated to say KC mill and we will go higher than a thousand here shortly but I'm going to say that this was 4 out. Now for one cable you cannot exceed 1693 pounds that's what the regs are but you add those three cables together to come up with 5079 the derator states that you can exceed 3352 pounds of ending tension on this cable pull. A lot of people believe that it's just this single number, but it's not. When you're pulling multiple cables in, you add them together and then the derator will take a percentage of it. So the theory is that there is at least two cables taking the brunt of the tension on the cable pull and that's why the 66 percent is here. They don't believe all three because of bends and different things so that's the safety number. On the sidewall pressure however each cable even from a cable manufacturer can be designed or constructed differently so the sidewall pressure is going to vary differently so you're going to need to get this number from the cable manufacturer. Now sidewall pressure, maximum sidewall pressure, I'll talk about that when we hit it here, but let's say that we go in here and I'm going to put a fictitious number in here just so we can show you how it blows it out on the next screen. It will give you a review here and we're going to hit accept. So you can see that with this coefficient of friction we've exceeded the sidewall pressure here and if we go up and we use a higher coefficient of friction or the people weren't using the right amount of lubricant or they weren't using polywater lubricants, remember all these coefficients of friction are based off of polywater's numbers, but if we're using these very conservative numbers you can see that we wouldn't be able to make the cable pull with this back tension. There's where the X's show up there. Now here we can say that we do zero and now you can see even by being conservative if we can take that back tension out of the equation look what happens to everything down here. So that's how important this is up here. Now in mode we've done most everything over here. We did variable coefficient of friction again that's where you have two different types of conduit systems joined together or you want to put a different number for sweeps so rigid seal sweeps. Now what is push-pull calculations? Push-pull is when you have a cable pusher so you actually have a machine that's pushing the cables into the conduit system. So what do those look like? Well those machines are usually a series of tires that are stacked on top of each other. You can see my art skills are phenomenal but you run your cable through those tires and the mouth of your conduit obviously wouldn't be this big but it would be right here. So these tires all turn and they push the cable into the conduit so they really help feed it in there. Now most cable pushers do 25 pounds or above. We haven't seen too many above 50. Um, we've seen one go as high as 75 but we're but we just don't know if that's uh, uh, possible out there. But let's go ahead and let's put in 25 pounds and see what it does to the tensions and sidewall pressure. 1, 4, 5, 4, and 92 is up there right now. So you can see that 
it brings it down a little bit here to 1451. So having that being fed in there will make a big difference down here. The last one up here, and when you change things, you've got to go back to standard. So we're going to put in zero is the high shear, low shear coefficient of friction. Now, a while ago, a long time ago, the industry did a study and what they felt was more accurate or what they developed was that when you have a straight run, that's your low shear friction coefficient of friction. But when you're going around bends in 90s, it's much more difficult because you have that sidewall pressure pushing on that bend. Well, if it's pushing on that bend, they felt that that coefficient of friction is different. So if you are um, of that group that you would like to put a low shear and a high shear number in here, you can. Now we believe at Polywater, because of all the testing that we do, remember the big blue, meaning our multi-bend tester in the friction table, that an average coefficient of friction works out better because we test the, num the test the numbers both ways. But if you believe that there are two different numbers out there, you can go ahead and do that. And I'm going to put in a number of 150 for sidewall pressure. And you can see that what it does is it puts in the numbers over here so that it differs. And you've got your variable coefficient of friction. And it, and it breaks it out between the straight section and the bends. So that's what high shear, low shear is. So we'll go back to standard. So we've done just about everything on here with the exception of adding a roller or a shiv. So let's go ahead and do that. And we're going to do that in segment five because remember we came into the vault or manhole and we have that roller in there. So we're going to do five. Now the roller tension add-on in pounds, what we believe is that we would take the coefficient of friction number that we're using, 0.35, and we would take the percentage of the incoming tension to do the roller add-on because you've got this tension going around the roller. There's not a lot of friction there because the rollers are moving. Now we know steel on steel rollers are the best. That's the best constructed, best rollers you can use, so you want to buy those. But there is a lot of industry discussion about this, whereas the industry talks about using 150 pounds no matter what when you, when you put this roller tension add-on. But here in this example, now if we were using our first coefficient of friction, we would, we, we would use 0.10 or 10%. We've got 0.35 up on there. So let's take 0.35 times 1454 and it's telling us it's 508. So we'll put in 508. This is very conservative. And then we need to put in the radius. So if it's a three foot radius, we'll go and do that. Now, what you will notice is that when we did this pull, we had the roller in here and I told you we were going to go up 20 feet and we were going to splice into some gear up here. You'll notice the biggest difference is that when we have these bends, the bend always asked us which way we were going, where we were turning up or down and which way we were pulling. The roller doesn't have that option, meaning it, it doesn't really care which way we're going, but if we were continuing the pull, we do care about that. So how would you do that? We have a roller in here and it's putting us up at 90 degrees. Well, we need to add this segment. So we're going to add it. Well, we're at 90 degrees now because we came around that roller. We're pulling up and we're going to pull 20 feet and we're going to come into no bend. So that's how you adjust it. So if it was horizontal instead of vertical, so if we were coming into a vault or a manhole, this is a pretty common occurrence. We have a roller in there to turn us to go to the right or a roller that turns us to the left. Then this, of course, would be zero degrees. This would not be in there, and we would go however far. If we were turning down, then obviously we would hit D for down here. But that's the way you use the roller or the shiv. 
The final thing is if we're pulling underneath a river or we're going across a bridge, how do you figure out really what the bend angle is or how long it is or how can you do that? So you go up to edit, uh, tool, tools rather, excuse me, and we're going to go down to large radius bend calculator. Now all we need to know is just two of these items and then we'll do the math for you and populate these boxes. So I told you that I wanted to do a under river crossing which is the C here, how long it is, and I'm going to say that from bank to bank, from one side of my conduit to the other, it was 327 feet. And I know from the top of my conduit to where the bottom of the duct is was 28 feet. When you hit enter, it's going to populate these uh, boxes for you. And then we need to insert as a pull segment. It will give you a review. And here it's going to round up from 38.9 to 39 degrees. And we're going to hit OK. Now it wants to know which type of a bend it is. Remember, uh, I'll change this, but you need to click in that box. What I was going to say, remember, this is a vertical concave up bend for your underwater, under lake crossing. This would be a vertical concave down bend going across a bridge because the bend is facing down. Horizontal, you might have had to do a directional bore somewhere or pull conduit around a structure or something, and that's what that would be. But remember, it's very, very easy to change. I would just go in here and click, and I'm going to click vertical concave up, and I was pulling down through that bend. Now you'll see here that the sidewall pressure went way, way down. Now this is obviously a ridiculous pull now, but we're just showing you what the pull planner can do. You can see that it's three degree or three pounds of sidewall pressure. And that's because on extremely long radius bends, it's almost like a straight run. So you take a lot of that sidewall pressure out. And sidewall pressure is greatly affected. If we went up here and we took a look at using two foot sweeps rather than four foot sweeps, you can see how it's affecting the sidewall pressure over here and the tension that it's, it keeps going up. So I've gone over everything on the pull planner. The last thing is, is how to save it. You go up to Save As. You can put in the name of your pull over here. We hit Save. Let's say we were going home for the day. Tomorrow you come in and you want to pull it up. You simply click in there. You go up to official. You open it up. It will always come to this screen as a review. Hit accept. It will bring you back to the column screen. Now, if you had the same cable and conduit configuration and you needed to do another pull, I would save this pull. Then I would come up here and I would go to delete segment. And I would just go ahead and I would delete these segments out because you've got everything in. You can change the name of your pull, enter your new data, save it again, and you're ready to rock and roll. We appreciate your time. If you have any questions whatsoever, please give American Polywater a call at 651-430-2270. We love to hear from you. We have over 3,000 people that use this software program on a really regular basis. Just remember, this is all based off of polywater lubricants, and you need to make sure you're specifying them on your jobs. Have a great day, everybody.